Okay, wonderful. Well, here I'm going to share my screen. But first off, uh, let me thank uh, Dean Norton for inviting me to be part of this uh, symposium. It was really an honor. I was very bummed that I couldn't be there in person, but uh, I'm glad that we've been able to take advantage of the, uh, the technology in the new library. And uh, this is exciting for me. And I also want to thank uh, Mark Siemens, uh, who has worked on the IT for this, and it's been flawless so far. So uh, I'm going to knock on wood. I'm going to share my screen, and we'll start my presentation. Okay. Can everybody see it okay? Yes. All right, great, great. And just a word of warning, I can see the first three rows on my screen. So if anyone gets up and leaves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, here we go. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about Thomas Jefferson's Poplar Forest and pr particularly about three landscape restoration projects that we've embarked on uh, in the past couple of years. But let me start off with giving just a little bit of background information of the history of Poplar Forest. And this is a, a house built by Thomas Jefferson uh, in Bedford County. He started the construction of it in 1806 and finished it by 1809, just in time for his retirement from the presidency. And he began coming down to this personal retreat uh, several times a year up until the time of his death in 1826. And he used it as, again, as a retreat, as a place of solitude, as a place to get away, to write, to think. And then later on in life, he began bringing his grandchildren down with him. So it was a place for him to spend time with his family as well. So it was a very personal place for Jefferson. Uh, and to provide just a little more background on it, uh, it's located in Bedford County. Jefferson originally received it in uh, 1773 is an inheritance from his father-in-law, John Wales. It was a 4,000-acre plantation. He was raising uh, tobacco and wheat on it. Um, let's see, it looks like the screen went kind of funny there, but we'll keep going. Um, and Jefferson, uh, first, he came down here very infrequently in the beginning. Uh, one of the first times he came down here, though, was in 1781. And he came down here because he was in capture from the British. And rather than go to Monticello, where everyone knew he lived, uh, he came down to Poplar Forest, where no one knew anything about Poplar Forest. And is everything okay? Are we having technical difficulties? No. Okay, great, great. Um, uh, again, yeah, no one knew much about Poplar Forest. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson didn't even really know exactly where it was. He had to hire a guide to get him to his own property. Uh, but when he came down here, when he was evading the British, he began thinking about Poplar Forest as more than just a tobacco plantation at the edge of the Piedmont. And he drew up at that time, while he was staying probably in pretty cramped quarters of an overseer's house, he drew up the first plan for a house and a landscape at Poplar Forest, which is the slide that you see in front of you now. This is a, the 1781 plan, where in the middle there, there's a little house. And then on the left, there is his garden. And then on the right, uh, which we've shaded in green, he used trees, whether they were naturally growing or whether he planned to plant them, we're not sure, but he used trees to frame a vista out to a distant mountain. And he actually wrote into the middle there, vista to Candler's Mountain. So he's using trees to bring a distant vista closer to the house. And this plan was never carried out, probably for a couple of reasons. One of them is that to the right, the garden there is actually on somebody else's property. So he didn't even own where the garden was planted. <laughs> Uh, the other uh, possible reason that this was never carried out is that you, you may be able to see a dotted line running through um, through the, the picture there. That is a main road carrying traffic to Lynchburg. And uh, this is not very conducive to a retreat atmosphere to have a, 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 a turnpike running through your front yard. So this was never carried out. Rather, this happened. And uh, so Jefferson moved his retreat house into the, more into the center of the plantation. And this gives you a nice idea of how the, the property is kind of nestled up against the Blue Ridge Mountains. And again, in 1806, he began constructing this house, finished in 1809, at least the exterior portion of it. And then in 1813, he added that wing that you see to the, to the right of the house there. And, um, but what we're going to be talking about primarily today is the landscape that Jefferson designed around this house. And we'll start with a, uh, a schematic that we've pulled together based on documentary and archaeological research. And I'll just kind of briefly go through some of the main elements of this landscape. So starting with the north 
uh, portion, you'll see a bunch of kind of fluffy little blobs up there. Those are all uh, tulip poplar trees that compose the north, kind of very naturalistic lawn of uh, the landscape directly around the house. Then the house itself is composed in a Palladian manner, you know, very Jefferson, of course, by flanking mounds, wings, and rows of trees, which we'll talk about more in more detail in a bit. And then the south of the house is more in keeping with the neoclassical, uh, neoclassical Jefferson, if you will, of uh, a sunken lawn, uh, much more geometrical, lined with flowering shrubs. And then this whole composition, which is, which is taking place in five acres, is ringed with a circular road that is lined with 160 paper mulberry trees. The south of the house is a sunken lawn. It was dug out to create the two mounds that flank the house. And the reason for doing this is part of Jefferson's Palladian plan, uh, where he's uh, using a five-part Palladian plan. But in this case, he's actually mixing uh, landscape elements and architectural elements. So the five parts you see there, the, cent the central uh, building flanked with wings and then with end pavilions at the end. At Poplar Forest, rather than build all these things, the mounds of dirt stand in as the pavilions, whereas rows of trees uh, would have composed one of the wings, and then eventually an actual wing itself was built on uh, the, uh, the east side of the house. Uh, the north core of the property, as I had mentioned, is dominated by a grove of tulip poplar trees. Five of them remain based on, uh, based on uh, both archaeological and photographic evidence. There were at least 13 poplar trees that once grew in the north yard. Uh, and based on tree rings of these tulip poplars, tree ring dates of these tulip poplars, they actually predate the construction of the house. They were standing as uh, uh, probably as early as the late 1700s. And I think this is a great example of Jefferson taking his own advice when he had uh, told somebody that one of the best ways to create gardens in America is to leave the vegetation you have, leave the trees we have, cut out the superabundant vegetation, and you have a garden, a naturalistic garden on par with what is happening on the English estates where they're having to plant thousands and thousands of trees. Uh, in, in America, we didn't have to do that. And so here, Jefferson seems to be doing that by leaving these trees on the hilltop to create part of his uh, landscape in front of the house. Uh, and I'm just kind of running through a couple, of, hitting on a couple of interesting elements of this landscape, and I'll get into the, the ones that we've restored here in a minute. Uh, the mounds, which are looking pretty stark here in this picture, uh, Jefferson's original plan for them is another good example of him blending together architecture and landscape elements where he planted the mounds originally with a square of weeping willow trees on the very top. He ringed the middle with golden, um, golden willow trees, and he ringed the base of the mounds with aspen trees planted every 15 feet. So if you look at the growing habits of these trees, the weeping willows on top are very mounding. It's like he's put a dome on top of this mound, whereas the aspen trees are straight. They're like columns at the base of the mound. So he's essentially created a neoclassical domed rotunda out of dirt and trees, which I think is just a wild idea. And then if you look to the, to the left there, you'll see one of the two privies that are on either side of the, uh, the mounds. And similar to other uh, uh, landscapes of the elites, the privies here in this case are really more garden temples than they are anything. Of course, great examples of that at Mount Vernon too. Uh, uh, Jefferson originally enclosed them with willow trees, weeping willow trees, and then eventually with privet hedge. And he even refers to them, as did some other folks at the time, as the Cloacinals, where Cloacina is the Roman goddess of the sewers. So they are literal temples to the Roman goddess of the sewers. Uh, the sunken lawn is, uh, we've excavated a good portion of the sunken lawn because Jefferson had instructed to have flowering shrubs planted down the banks of the lawn and our excavations have actually found the planting holes for these shrubs. So those dark circular stains, actually that are excavated in this picture, are the actual holes that were cut into the clay to plant the shrubs, which consisted of Altheas, Gelder roses, roses, and calicanthus, as well as lilac. So if we pull all this information together, we can start to get a, a kind of conjectural view of what poplar forests look like. But in some cases, we still don't have all the details that we need to put back all these elements in the landscape and put them back accurately. Uh, so this past, excuse me, in 2010, 
we embarked on three projects to start actually putting vegetation back into the ground, restoring these landscape elements, and using archaeological research to guide and provide all the details for these restorations. So the three projects that we've embarked on include uh, restoring the west double row of paper mulberry trees, which is one of the, uh, the, a row of trees that created one of these naturalistic wings between the house and the mound. Uh, the second project was to look at two clumps of trees at the north corners of the house. And then the third project was to look at the Jefferson era uh, carriage turnaround configuration. So in this slide here, you can just kind of see the areas highlighted that we were going to be investigating and then uh, with the intent of restoring them based on the evidence uh, found in our excavations. So the first project was to restore this double row of paper mulberry trees. And the only documentary evidence we had to go on was a very brief reference in Jefferson's planting memorandum from 1812, where he says, plant a double row of paper mulberries from stairways to the mounds. And that's it. There is no reference to how many trees were planted, on what interval they were planted, um, how wide the rows were, because in 1813, the very year after planting these trees, Jefferson builds a wing on the one side of the house. So the, we question whether Jefferson had ripped out all these trees he had planted just the year before. So being archeologists, we do what we do best, or we did what we do best, which is go into the ground and start digging. And we laid out a block of units, a 50 foot by 45 foot uh, square uh, or block of units here and started digging. And the lines emanating from the house there are the potential lines that we thought that these trees might have fallen on based just on Jefferson's documents. But we decided that we needed to go further out than that, so we had widened our, the scope of our project well beyond the, those alignments there. And a shot of our excavations at the beginning there, so kind of give you an idea of what this looks like when we're doing these types of projects. And if you're wondering, well, what can you find of trees that are no longer in the ground and that have been gone for 200 years? Uh, and I hope that you can see this, but there are, there are dark stains left in the ground, left by the rotted root systems of these trees. So when the trees uh, are taken away, cut down, whatever happens to them, and the roots are left in there, they rot and they create this dark organic soil that shows up against the bright red clay of the Piedmont. And so that's what we find. And we document them and we excavate them. And the result is this. You get essentially the negative of the root system of a tree you can start to plot the exact locations of where trees were growing. Additionally, as part of this project, uh, we dug into one of the mounds because we wanted to see if we could find some of the remains of the aspen trees that Jefferson had planted at the base of the mound, thinking that they were a part of the plan that went along with the double row. Uh, so you see an excavation shot there looking into the, into the, the stratigraphy of the mound, and you might be able to see it there's a dark band of soil at the bottom there. It's labeled HPZ. That is the ground surface from 1807 when the, uh, the mound was constructed. So it's a snapshot in time right there. It's kind of a little time capsule for us. So that, that is where you would have been standing in 1807 right there. And then in front of it, uh, you can also see the remains of the root system of a tree, which is actually one of the aspen trees planted at the base of the mound. So we map all this stuff, we put it on maps, and we start to try to discern patterns from uh, the locations of all of these things. And what we discovered is that uh, the trees were spaced exactly 30 feet apart and that they were on a 20-foot interval. And the 30-foot um, spacing was interesting to us. At first, we were kind of curious as to why 30 feet until we looked at Jefferson's planting memorandum about the mounds where he stated that he was planting the aspen trees every 15 feet. So the idea, and here's another excavation shot, the idea was for these trees to all line up. The uh, paper mulberry trees would intersect with two of the aspen trees at the base of the mound, and then there'd be a center aspen tree on the center line, uh, also at the base of the mound. So a 30-foot width is also interesting because you could fit a wing in between them. The wings themselves are only 22 feet wide. So you could actually squeeze another wing in between these, uh, uh, these double rows of trees if you wanted. So we went and we looked at uh, excavations that we had conducted in the early 1990s, which you see here, against the foundation of the wing that Jefferson built. And sure enough, we had found the remains of trees right up against 
the foundations of the wing over there. So Jefferson had done that. He seems to have squeezed his wing in between rows of trees that he had planted one year prior. So when you pull it all together, this is this is what you get. This is kind of the the, the plan for all of this. There have been eight trees total as part of the double row of trees, and then they intersect with the aspen trees at the base of the mound. And again, here it is with a conjectural wing squeezed in between them. And then if you kind of pull it all together to see both sides, this is what we've discovered was going on. And one thing about the wing, and for those of you who have been to Monticello, and hopefully you've been to, to Poplar Forest as well, you will know that the wings uh, that Jefferson designed had flat roofs on them, and you could walk around on, on them. And that was the one of the main purposes of the wings, is to be able to take exercise on them. And Jefferson, uh, in his choice of paper mulberry trees, uh, at least in a, a letter to his neighbor, Charles Clay, his Poplar Forest neighbor, uh, he tells Charles Clay why he likes the paper mulberry tree. So he says, I send you paper mulberries. He's swapping trees back and forth here with Charles Clay. He says, I send you paper mulberries, valuable for the regularity of their form, velvet leaf, and being fruitless. They are charming near a porch for densely shading it. So Jefferson is choosing this tree because of its, its shade qualities, amongst other things. And then to see him planting them right against the foundations of the wing, uh, and then also in a way that he could fit a wing in between them later, certainly shows that he's thinking about using them to provide shade over top of the flat deck of the, ring, uh, the wing, almost creating an outdoor room out of these trees. And if we turn to Monticello to see what he's doing there, there's uh, the earliest plan for Monticello from 1771, shows a very similar sort of plan in, in which there are trees uh, lining the wings. And you can see them there, the kind of like little bullseyes, and I've got the intervals that Jefferson notes in between them. Uh, 15 feet, 15 feet, he then splits a staircase of seven on one and seven on the other side. And then this is great, this is just so Jefferson. Uh, the next intervals are 13 feet, 4.23 inches. I mean, who can get a tree that, that closely spaced? I think it's just Jefferson carrying out the math and kind of satisfying himself. But anyhow, the point here is that, uh, actually, these trees have been found at Monticello as well, archaeologically, it's just an archaeological plan of them. Uh, so we know that they were planted there and they were planted near the foundations of the wings at Monticello as well. Uh, and from an 1825 um, uh, painting of Monticello, I mean, the wings are just embowered in, in trees lining them. So this really seems to be what Jefferson is going for, just lining these wings uh, with trees very close to them and creating shade over top of them. So armed with all this information, we filled everything back in and we got ready to replant the trees at Poplar Forest. And here we are getting ready this December of 2011. And um, you can see our holes ready there. And I always like to share the story that uh, Bill Alexander from the Biltmore uh, asked me when he saw this picture. He said, Jack, why did you guys dig square holes for trees with round root balls? And I said, well, we're archaeologists. That's what we do. <laughs> we, know, we know of no other way to dig a hole. So, so we've got square holes for our round root balls. Uh, and here they are in the ground in their first spring. And then just a couple days ago, here they are coming, uh, starting to really fill out and starting to uh, you start to see the qualities that Jefferson's going for. In the end, there'll be an unbroken line of vegetation going from the mound to the house, uh, creating shade through there. And so it's it's only eight trees total, but the transformation that's created has been has been wonderful. Uh, here's an overhead shot to give you kind of a full composition where you can see the wing there on the left-hand side of the house, and then the trees uh, kind of filling out and finishing the composition on the, the right-hand side of the house there. So a very rewarding project, and um, it's, it's great to see those trees go back in the ground. Now, the second project that we've been working on is uh, looking at clumps of trees that Jefferson had planted at the corners of the house. And much like the uh, planting memorandum for the paper mulberry trees, the, the, the detail wasn't there for us to actually be able to restore this. Uh, you're seeing there the what's in his planting memorandum. And he stated just a clump of Athenian and balsam poplars at each corner of the house. 
intermix and then a, a variety of different trees. So there's no number of trees included in there. There's no intervals of trees and there's no size of the clump or even what he meant by the word clump. And so we started our research by looking at uh, a lot of information on English estates, uh, particularly those uh, and the, the estate uh, designs uh, from the mid to late 1700s uh, to see if we could see, are there clumps? I mean, what, how, how are they being referred to in the estate gardens? And what we discovered is that clumps were all over the place. They were everywhere. They became very popular uh, by William Kent. William Kent really kind of started the clump rage and he was planting them in all the landscapes that he designed. You can see one of his designs here and all those things there, those are clumps where this, these kind of tightly grouped, almost circular clusters of trees. And here's another one of his designs where you see the clumps kind of uh, flanking a little garden temple there. And Kent used the clump so much that Horace Walpole wrote that he would rather be driven into the sea two miles at low tide than go see one more of William Kent's tree clumps. <laughs> so he used, he used them all over the place, but, uh, and they drew a lot of critiques, but it didn't stop people from planting them. And they, they, they became really popular. And we know that clump was the actual term that was being used to describe them. And we've got a, a design here, we kind of zoom in there, and it says clump of elms. And we even, in this estate anyway, they even, uh, they painted that, that very clump. You can see it off to the side there. So we're getting really good visual evidence of what people mean by a clump. And so what is Jefferson meaning when he says clump? Uh, another example of one here from a, an estate called Ranston. And uh, in this case, uh, the designer has kind of mixed in some other types of trees. Most of the clumps that we see Kent designing are a single species, uh, range very circularly. Uh, in this case, uh, there seems to be a mixture in this clump here of, of tall trees, mid-story trees, and then some, uh, some shrubbery at the base there. And Jefferson wrote about clumps when he toured the gardens with John Adams in 1786. Uh, particularly at Esher Place, where he says that the clumps balance finely, and he describes the pleasing effect of clumps that are leading up to a garden temple on a hill. And I, I'm, I'm almost positive that that is what we're seeing in this picture here, um, published it's a few years after Jefferson was there himself. So we see a clump right up there on that little hill while leading up to that, um, uh, that garden temple. Another example, and this is just, this is really striking here. This is for, from uh, a, a garden temple, in a park called Parc Monceau in Paris. It's the Temple of White Marble. And you can see these very naturalistic and wild clumps at the corners of the house. And then look off to the side, to the right hand side, there is a double row of trees over there. Boy, it, 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 this one really strikes us as being similar to Poplar Forest, but there is no evidence that Jefferson ever saw this, uh, saw this building, although the park was located only uh, about a mile away from his lodgings at uh, when he was stationed in Paris. Um, so maybe he saw them, but uh, it's just a, a very striking image. But, you know, the clumps were not uh, confined to England. They made their way over, and, uh, and people in America were also planting clumps, including Jefferson's political rival, Alexander Hamilton. Here we see his clump, and, Jer and Hamilton refers to it in his, uh, uh, one of his planting uh, memos, as the clump of trees. So again, we know that that's what these things are called. His clump actually survived into the age of photography, so we get a picture of it. You can see how densely those, those trees are there, uh, although some of them are probably suckers coming up off of earlier trees. And by looking at, uh, at gardening manuals too, we start to see descriptions of clumps. And this one, uh, for instance, uh, a clump is described as round and compact, it is called a clump, C letter A, and there's letter A. It's a round, compact grouping of trees. And I, I have to tip my cap here to Will Riley, who has uh, uh, done a lot of research along with us into clumps and has discovered these just wonderful quotes, and I'll just read little bits and pieces of them. But turning back to the critiques, I mean, while, while the clumps are very popular in England, people also like to make fun of them, it seems. 
so looking at the critiques, we get an idea of what they look like. And um, uh, the Walpole, again, you can see him at the bottom there, Mr. Kent's passion, taking on Kent again. That is sticking a dozen trees here and there till a lawn looks like the tin of spades. And then uh, another one uh, is critiquing clumps and that saying that they, they just don't look natural. Um, so in walking about a natural group, the form of it changes at each step, new combination, new lights and shades, new inlets present themselves in succession. But clumps like compact bodies of soldiers resist attacks from all quarters. So like, you know, these things were pretty compact um, and, and dense uh, groupings of trees. But Jefferson seemed to have liked the clump and he planted them, or at least he planned to have them planted at the White House. We see an 1807 plan for the White House here. Uh, and you can see the arrow pointing there to clump. And even if you look at some of the uh, individual little planting arrangements in this plan, I think those could also be characterized as clumps as well. And of course, he did it at Monticello, and uh, the lecturer following me will uh, probably take uh, exception with this interpretation. This is the uh, interpretation that, that Will and I currently have about the clumps at, at uh, Monticello, where he planted them as well, um, you know, kind of squeezing them in between his oval beds. At Monticello, he left behind at least the numbers of trees that he planted and uh, kind of the arrangement, a little bit of the arrangement uh, for Monticello. So we have really good information about what a clump is. So a dense, compact grouping of trees, but we still didn't know for Poplar Forest how big that clump was, how many trees were in the clump, uh, and where exactly they were all located. So we went into the ground and we dug uh, and found, again, the root remains of these trees. And the, uh, the pink blobs that you see there are all the remains of trees that we discovered, an aerial shot kind of looking down. And what we discovered is that the clumps here were pretty bounded and they were they were circular. Uh, and we could even start to get an idea from the archaeological excavations what was planted in some of these. We could tell the difference between a shrub planting versus a tree planting. And we know from Jefferson's uh, planting memoranda that he was planting calacanthus in here. So uh, based on the morphology of the planting stains we found, we think we can pinpoint exactly where the calacanthus were planted. Additionally, black locust. We uh, were able to discover where one of the black locusts was planted uh, based on both the excavations as well as uh, one of the earliest photos of Poplar Forest that shows, or well, pretty certain is a black locust standing there at the northwest corner of the house. And uh, actually during the excavation, we found the intact roots of that tree. What we wanted to do then is, once we had an idea of the boundary of the clump, uh, we wanted to make sure that it was a hard boundary and that we really did have it. So we conducted a type of research called phytolith analysis. And phytoliths are microscopic plant fossils that drop into the ground from a plant whenever it decays. And uh, they remain there for a very long time. And it's really good at identifying different types of grasses. So what we did is we looked at the phytoliths for grass types around the clumps. We wanted to see where is, are there any differences between sun-loving grasses versus shade-loving grasses. And what we discovered is that the majority, uh, so high concentrations are represented in red in these graphs, high concentrations of sun-loving grasses were all outside of where we thought the clump boundary was. Whereas shade-loving grasses, it was the exact opposite. They were all on the inside and on the north side of the clump. So what we had actually found here was really the the 200-year-old shade pattern of the clumps, which is pretty neat to think about. But it gave us you know, uh, really good um, evidence that the clump was a, had hard and fast boundaries to it and was confined, much as we saw in the, the different uh, estates in England. And then once we started looking at the measurements of these things, we discovered even more uh, you know, kind of nuances to this. And the size of these clumps, they are uh, exactly 33 feet in diameter. Or they have a 16 and a half foot radius. They are located, the centers of them are located 33 feet away from the portico of the house. And the centers are also located exactly 66 feet away from the center of the carriage turnaround. And, you know, when we discovered, when we made these measurements, we were wondering why 33 feet? And when Will Riley took a look at this, he immediately recognized that those lengths are the lengths of 
a surveyor's chain. So Jefferson, who is a trained surveyor, is using uh, a chain to lay out these clumps. And once we, once we had that idea, we went back, we took a look at the documents uh, from November of 1812 when the clumps were being planted. And what we discovered is this letter, this wonderful letter between Jefferson and Charles Clay, his neighbor, his Poplar Forest neighbor, which is it's a nice letter for a variety of reasons, particularly you know, Mrs. Clay begs the acceptance of a cheese of her own make as a testimony of her high respect for that patriot. And you can read the rest, blah, blah, blah. But the big part of it says, the bearer brings you the compass chain, etc. So in November, which is when Jefferson notes that the clumps are being planted, there's a letter between him and his neighbor where he is getting a chain, a surveyor's chain. So we, we're, we're almost certain that he is using that, that to help lay out the clumps. Uh, and then once we looked a little bit deeper, so the, the boundaries are laid out using survey measurements. Uh, and then we wanted to kind of understand, well, all right, the interior arrangement of these trees, what is, what is going on there? Why do they look the way they look? And again, uh, uh, a tip of the, the hat to uh, Will Riley on this one, by looking at Batty Langley's practical geometry, where he spells out how to lay out spirals, if we take one of his methods for laying out a spiral, overlay it onto what we found, so the, the X's there mark where we found trees, a, they fall exactly on one of Batty Langley's spirals. And, and Batty Langley's uh, book is one that Jefferson has in his library, uh, who, which he consults often. So he's using all these things, these methods, to help lay out his clump. It's not just a random grouping of trees in the ground, it's highly organized. And again, turning to Monticello, there's great precedent for Jefferson using spirals at Monticello too, such as the spiral of Scotch broom. And also in an 1808 plan for Monticello, which was never carried out, also spiral plantings of trees there as well, which are highlighted in that slide. So we took all this information and uh, we started to model it to see what it looked like before we actually put it in the ground. As I always like to joke, it's much cheaper to, to destroy a digital tree than to yank a, a real one out of the ground. So we, we wanted to make sure we got it right and it looked right first. So some digital models were created um, and kind of getting an idea of what it would look like before we put them in the ground. And it looks like a, a very naturalistic grouping of trees. So Jefferson seems to almost be countering the critiques of clumps, where people are saying they're too rigid, they're too circular, they don't actually mimic the outlines of trees or of natural groves of trees. But when Jefferson does the things that he does by using the survey measurements, by using the spiral, and by using different um, species of trees, the end effect is very naturalistic. And so again, armed with that information, we went into the ground and started planting these things. In this case, we did actually plant cir or dig circular holes. We, uh, we gave in on that one. <laughs> and here they are for the first time. We just planted these in December, and this is the northeast clump. Um, and we got to see it bloom for the first time this year. And just a couple days ago. Another couple of images running through here, looking back to the house. So again, I, uh, the thing that we really learned from this is that you know, despite the very rigid, almost rigid layout of these things and, and all of the, um, you know, even the math used to lay it out, it looks like they just sprung up out of the ground, which is exactly the, the effect that a clump was supposed to have. Uh, and now that we've got them back on the ground, it's it's just fantastic to see them. Um, we like to brag that we we know we know of no other uh, place that has replanted uh, an early 19th century clump. So we're pretty happy to have them there. And then let me finish up here really quick. Uh, let's say we've got about five more minutes here. Uh, and so let me uh, wrap up with our last project, which is still really in progress. And that project is trying to understand the carriage turnaround in front of uh, the house. And you see it here. Uh, it is lined with, uh, well, I should say it was lined with American boxwoods on the outside and a, a maze of English boxwoods in the middle. 
And so the questions that we had about this project are, uh, what was Jefferson's carriage turnaround paved with? Uh, as you see there in this picture, it's just kind of grass and modern gravel. And uh, additionally, were the boxwoods part of Jefferson's original design? And the design that, uh, that we see at least outlined um, by the boxwoods and the gravel that's there today is very similar to the design that Jefferson came up with for the White House. You see a carriage turnaround there uh, in front of the White House. A very similar, it's a, it's a bit larger than the Poplar Forest one, but um, very similar in configuration. And so again, we did what we do best and we started digging and we discovered underneath uh, you know, modern layers of gravel and layers of gravel going all the way back to the, to the mid uh, 1800s, that they were covering over a 12 foot wide uh, cobblestone paving. Uh, uh, another picture of it, it's 15 feet wide in the entrance and then it goes down to 12 feet in the circle. And what we discovered uh, is our, our artifacts uh, that were embedded into this surface. One of them, and it's a pretty humble object, but it gave us a, a ton of information about the turnaround is, and I'll see if I can move my cursor and you might be able to see it, but my cursor is going to kind of circle around the very humble object that I'm speaking of. And this is a column brick. This is one of the bricks used to create the columns of the house. And they were fired in 1807. They were never fired again. Uh, no other column bricks have ever been made. And the columns are all original. So this is a cast off. This is one that was thrown away after the original firing. So to find it embedded in the surface uh, really makes us believe that the surface, this cobblestone surface was laid down uh, very soon after Jefferson completed the construction of the house around uh, 1809. Uh, so this is the surface that, that Jefferson had. Here's another picture of it. It's been destroyed in some locations, which is you can see one of our archaeologists kind of squatting down in an area where it's no longer there, but just to the left of where you can see how tightly packed it actually is. And looking at the very front of the house, in front of the steps of the house, we discovered that there is a three foot wide almost crosswalk across it uh, with larger flat stones, almost as if it's an area in which you could um, you know, dismount a horse or get out of a carriage before walking into the house. And then because we're archeologists, we mapped every single rock out there. So if we ever wanna put these things back exactly, we could, but we would be crazy to do that, I think so. But anyhow, just a, an example of one of our maps of how detailed we get with these projects. So we've got a really good idea of the paving of the turnaround. So it's this, this tightly packed cobblestone paving. But then the question was, were these boxwoods part of that plan? And so you can see it, what they look like, the plan of them right there. And um, here's our attempt at a, uh, at a 1960s uh, album cover. Just to give you some scale. <laughs> this just gives you some scale of, of the size of the boxwoods. Uh, but anyhow, so we wanted to date the boxwoods. We wanted to know how old they were. And we, we tried ring dating them several years ago, cutting down one and, and counting the rings on it. Uh, unfortunately, boxwoods uh, have, as it's been described, eccentric rather than concentric ring growth. And so the, they don't always put on a ring every year. Sometimes the rings grow together. Uh, and so it's very difficult to get an idea of, just from the rings of how old they were. Additionally, we're looking at third, maybe you know, second, maybe third generation growth without the original boxwood stump. We, we didn't know how old they were. So what we did is we dug around them. We went underneath them and we very carefully dug around these boxwoods looking to see what layers of soil they were planted in uh, to get an idea you know, from the artifacts in these layers of soil, uh, how old they might be. And what we discovered is that they are planted in a foot deep layer of fill that has uh, tra household trash mixed in it, all of it from the mid 1800s. Matter of fact, most of it dating to the 1840s and 1850s. So this gave us a really good idea that the boxwoods were post Jefferson. Jefferson dies in 1826. Uh, and so pretty good, pretty good data to suggest that the boxwoods were not planted by him, but rather in the mid 1800s. And then underneath this fill, we discovered a large linear um, planting bed is what it seems to be that was filled with dark organic soil and it too, and it runs underneath all the boxwoods. It, it, there, you know, it, whatever it is, it predates the boxwoods because it goes underneath them. They have to have come after this thing. 
and embedded in this layer of soil was a fragment of a piece of ceramic called the with a pattern on it called the Napier pattern that dates to no earlier than 1833. So even this feature is not from Jefferson's landscape design. The boxwoods are on top of it. So there is just no way, it was the smoking gun to say that the boxwoods were definitely not planted by Thomas Jefferson. So what did we do? We got rid of them. So we removed the box. I don't know if those are I don't know if those are hoorays or boos. I'm gonna think that they're hoorays. <laughs> and the project continues on. We're not finished with this project right now. The last question uh, that we're trying to answer is, okay, so the boxwoods weren't part of Jefferson's design. That long linear possible garden bed wasn't part of Jefferson's design. What was Jefferson's design? Uh, so we're going to be doing some more analysis on this project through the rest of this year. We're going to do a little bit more digging this summer to see if we can answer some of those questions. And then we'll start moving towards a restoration plan for uh, this area of, of uh, the property. And just to kind of close here, I'm kind of leaving you with a cliffhanger there to see what it's going to be, uh, how it's going to be restored. But just to kind of close here, here we are looking at the north of the house, boxwoods in place. And here we are today, no boxwoods. So it has been a dramatic change. It is a much more accurate view of the house now. And our next uh, tasks will be to determine the best way to uh, restore the cobblestone surface of the carriage turnaround, and also to figure out what was in the center of the carriage turnaround in terms of Jefferson era planting so that we can restore those as well. So those are the projects we've been working on at Poplar Forest. I'm, I'm just thrilled that I've been able to relate them to you today and to do it digitally. Um, and I, I want to thank, uh, I, went, I went blank, I hope you're still there, but um, I want to thank uh, in particular the Garden Club of Virginia for their very generous support of all three of the projects that I've just related to you today. And with that, I'll close and uh, I hope the rest of the symposium goes great. I wish I was there with you, uh, but uh, I hope the day is as beautiful there as it is here. So thank you.